Hi, everyone. I'm Chris with National Parents Organization, and today I'm here with Dr. Linda Nielsen, who has uh, written a new book uh, about myths and lies about dads, and uh, we're here to talk about it today. And she's here to talk to us about the 10 most uh, damaging myths about dads and fathers. Uh, so, Dr. Nielsen, Linda, thank you so much for coming on today. You're so welcome. It's my pleasure. I know a lot of times uh, when we talk about shared parenting or parental alienation, you know, the, the topic around dads often comes up and there's a lot of, I think, misinformation uh, around dads and fathers and, and particularly around the role that dads and fathers have in society. Um, you know, I think particularly as society has evolved over the last, you know, 50 or 70 years here. So uh, you were going to cover the, the 10 most damaging myths. So what, what are those? Well, let's start with the beginning of a child's life. Let's start with infancy. So those are some big myths there about fathers. So let me hit four of them. Infants form an earlier and stronger emotional bond with mom than with dad. That's a very popular myth. Another myth, moms have a greater impact than dads on babies and toddlers. So therefore, mothering time is much more important than fathering time for our little babies and our toddlers. Another myth, when the baby spends more than a few days a month away from the mother, their bond gets weaker. And a fourth myth, one I really like is, men don't undergo any hormonal changes or any brain changes after their babies are born. Only women go through that. Those are four very popular myths, so let's look at what the research tells us. First, infants are not capable of forming an emotional bond to anyone. Baby brains aren't ready to do that. So for the first six or seven months, that baby is not emotionally bonded to any other human being. At about six or seven months of age, babies do start to bond and they bond equally in strength and importance. They form an equal bond to their mom as to their dad. It is not true that when babies spend a few days a month away from their mothers that it weakens their bond. This is not true. This has been disputed by decades of re research on the separation between mothers and babies when those babies are very young. And finally, men do undergo hormonal changes. When men become fathers, their testosterone level decreases and their levels of hormones such as oxytocin, which are the bonding hormones, increase. Brain activity also increases in fathers when they are interacting with their children, their babies. Their brains are more active. The father's brains are more active in those areas that are associated with bonding. In other words, babies need their dads and, and bond with their dads just as they do with their mothers. Those are some baby myths that have huge ramifications. So what's, uh, you know, oftentimes we hear the argument, well, you know, mom needs to breastfeed or things like that. Um, you know, what, what do you say to those, those sorts of arguments? Um, you know, there's the emotional aspect of it. And then there's maybe I think a practical one that people bring up. And um, I, I think I have my answer, but I, I'd like to hear it from you. Well, practically, we know that most American couples decide together that the mother is going to do two thirds of the direct child care. And the father is going to have to be shouldering two thirds of the financial child care. That's how most American couples sort of get stuck having to work it out. So of course that means that the mother and doesn't have to be breastfeeding. You know, we have mothers who adopt children. We have mothers who can't or don't breastfeed for other reasons. There are a range of activities that mothers do more often than fathers do. This does not affect the child's bonding emotionally to that parent. That's the crucial part, that the bonding that that child feels towards each parent isn't dependent on 
who's feeding them. I think it's it's so important to remember that there are just a variety of situations, you know, um, when it comes to raising kids and, and, you know, how people choose to live their lives and that sort of thing. So that was the first four. Uh, what are the other six? It, let's go. Uh, one of my favorites is that dads are slouches on couches. You guys just are not doing your fair share of the work to raise kids. And you're really happy about that. You're just pleased as punch to dump all of the child rearing burdens onto the women. Another version of that is that mothers are very stressed out raising kids, but fathers are not stressed out raising kids. Here we get the myth of the mother being overwhelmed, stressed out, Uh, a a recent book called Screaming on the Inside, that the mothers are really emotionally a wreck from having to take care of the children, raise the children, but that the dads are just fine. You know, you're you're perfectly happy with the status quo. So let's look at the myth of the lazy slouch couch potato father. If we add up the total number of hours of paid and unpaid work that parents do, mothers are doing about 62 hours a week and fathers are doing 62 hours a week. They're not doing the same kinds of childcare work, but they are doing equal work on behalf of their children. How does this break down? People who work, parents who work more than 50 hours a week, more than 50 hours a week, 3% of them are women, 20% of them are men. When mothers work full time outside the home, fathers are still doing seven to 10 hours more work a week at work on behalf of their children. That is childcare. It's financial child care. Two thirds of the people who have to be at work before 8 a.m. are fathers. People who have to get up and leave home between midnight and five o'clock in the morning, three times as many of those people are fathers. Most fathers are not happy with that arrangement. They say if they could have their way, if we had the magic family fairy who would give us all what we really want and what we said we wanted before we had kids, fathers are overwhelmingly saying they wish they could spend less time at work and they wish they could spend more time at home. This includes fathers who are not college educated. This is College-educated fathers, non-college-educated fathers. The situation as it is means both parents are contributing equally to their kids, but not in the same way. As far as stress, fathers are experiencing and reporting as much stress as mothers are trying to balance work and family. Both of them are overwhelmed. Both of them are stressed out. Both of them are exhausted. And this is the price they both pay for having chosen to be parents. One thing I want to ask you about is, you know, uh, over time, I think some of these, uh, you know, uh, stigmas or, um, you know, myths about fathers really are outdated, right? I think they sometimes they were some they were true at some point in time, but our society has changed to a point where they're no longer true. Um, I, I like to bring up the example of uh, changing stations in men's bathrooms. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, you, you couldn't find a place to change a diaper in a men's bathroom hardly. And now it's pretty standard um, for most public bathrooms, you know, especially in, um, you know, larger uh, metropolitan areas to have, uh, you know, changing stations in the men's bathrooms, which I think is fantastic. Um, you know, what's the research say on that? And and uh, what's your opinion on it? Well, again, Our attitudes, our beliefs, our desires, especially younger fathers, men under the age of 40, you know, you are a different generation. What you want 
is not just changing tables in the bathrooms. That's nice. But what men are saying they want, what men are crying out for is, we wish you would give us, you being society, we wish you would give us more time with our children. That's very different from having a changing table in the bathroom. Because what we still see, even for the younger generation of fathers, is they are still carrying the majority of the burden of financial child raising. Therefore, you can't have that time to spend with your children. You can't be in two places at one time. So yes, I agree with you, Chris, that especially younger fathers are saying, we want more fathering time. That doesn't mean we're getting it. Our country pretty much gets an F when we come to our father-friendly policies. We're not doing too good a job there. Yeah, and I don't know really any dads that if you gave them the choice of, you know, going to work and, and working their, their normal job or, you know, spending some time hanging out with the kids and, and, you know, doing kid things, which includes all of the hard parenting stuff, you know, changing diapers is just the beginning, but, you know, picking up messes and, you know, even on to disciplining, it's not all just playtime, but I, I really don't know any fathers that would say, yeah, I'd like to go sit at my desk job for eight hours over, you know, dealing with the kids. I mean, th there might be times when, you know, they need a break or something for an hour or two, but, but by and large, I don't know any dads that really would pick, you know, going, going to their job, uh, you know, and doing job stuff over going and, and really having family time with the kids. So I think you make a fantastic point there that, um, you know, we, what, I think what's interesting is, you know, what society says or what, what dads get accused of maybe in a court case, I think it's drastically different from what they really want. And I, I think in, in some ways it's almost abusive how, uh, you know, people are saying, well, you're a father, so you want this. Well, no, you should ask me what I want because you can't tell me, <laughs> you know, you're not in my head. Right. Um, so I, I think that's a, a, a big thing that we need to overcome, uh, particularly in the legal system. Right. And in the same way, mothers don't have the freedom. When, when we constrict fathers by these stereotypes, you're not just hurting the fathers because you're depriving the children of time with their fathers. It also restricts the mother's freedom to make choices. She might want to spend more time away from home earning money. But these gender role beliefs that we have, these myths and lies we have about fathers, restrict the mother as well as restricting the father. But the real person who pays the price is the child because the child is being deprived of that fathering time. And this is where you, you can't change the beliefs and give people, parents, the freedoms they need until we make some of these policy changes, including custody laws. Absolutely. So what are some of the other myths that you've got Mm -hmm. The others I like is, is specifically, since I mentioned custody laws, there are a lot of myths and very negative stereotypes about divorced fathers. One myth is that most divorced fathers don't pay any of their child support. They, they have the money and they're just not going to fork it over. The fact is, according to the U.S. Census Department, only 20 percent of divorced fathers don't pay child support. So divorced dads are paying their child support. Second myth about divorced dads is that they're far better off financially than their ex-wives after the divorce. You know, they're, they're living the good life and the mother and the kids are struggling. This is not again what the data show. The, the lifestyles, the financial lifestyles of the divorced dad and the divorced mom are very similar. And the third myth is that divorced fathers don't suffer the way that divorced mothers do emotionally. In other words, you're less affected by the divorce. This again is not true. Divorced men are more clinically depressed. They use more drugs and alcohol and they are more suicidal after the divorce. The main reason for this is that they miss their kids. So in terms of the emotional suffering, the divorced father is emotionally suffering as much or more than his ex-wife. 
Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. And I just want to spend a minute here on it because, uh, you know, it, it intrigues me how, um, you know, sometimes in, in custody cases, you know, this comes up, the uh, the arguing about who suffers more, right? And and really, it's it's very sad because, you know, really the, the courts and the laws should be focused on people suffering the least, right? Not somebody suffering equal to somebody right. else. To me, it's a, it's a, it's incredibly weird way of thinking about it and a backwards way of thinking about it. And, and for a system that's designed to really have the best interests of the kids to ensure that somebody suffers in that equation, uh, really <laughs> is just backwards to me. I, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I think too, the the focus should be what's best for the kids because they're the ones who are really suffering. And instead of saying, is it the dad versus the mom? Let's take that contest away, okay? And say, the kids are suffering the most because after that divorce, given the way the custody laws are set up, those custody laws are based on the myths and lies we have about fathers. So until the custody laws can can free themselves from those myths and stereotypes, we're not going to be able to give kids the fathering time that the kids deserve. And that's who's suffering is the kids. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, really, if, if you if you re, you know, if the system was truly about the best interest of the kids, then they would the system would also be focused on the, the health and well-being of the parents you know, uh, particularly emotionally, because when, when the parents suffer, then they, I think they transfer that onto the kids, uh, in, in a multitude of ways. And, and it's never very healthy, uh, mm -hmm. when it happens. Mm -hmm. And that brings us Chris to the last set of, of myths, which is the inferior parent myth. And that is that fathers just aren't the equal of mothers in terms of the quality of parenting that you can provide. So this myth takes several forms. One is, well, because you're men, that dads are less empathetic, less compassionate, and less skilled at communicating. We have decades of research showing us that when it comes to empathy, compassion, or skill in communicating, there are no significant differences between men and women. Uh, there was a book called uh, Venus and Mars, you know, men are from Venus, women are from Mars, or women are from Venus, men are from Mars. According to the research, uh, men are from North Dakota and women are from South Dakota. <laughs> um, <you know. laughs> really not that far, yeah. huh? Not even that far. The differences in empathy, compassion, and communication, there are more differences within each gender than there are between the two. So this really, again, is saying that when it comes to parenting, the quality of parenting, you can't provide the empathy, the compassion, or communicate as well with your kids, which is false. You communicate differently, perhaps, than mothers do, but inferior to mothers, the research doesn't back that. Second part of that is that the mother's second myth is that the mother's more nurturing, comforting style of parenting is better than the father's style. The father does tend to be um, more blunt and honest with the kids. The father tends to to tolerate less immature behavior. The father is more willing to let the kids uh, struggle with failure and frustration. The father is more uh, demanding in terms of expecting more maturity. So we've got differences in parenting styles. We know that, though those are coming closer together as mothers and fathers share roles. But differences does not mean one is inferior to the other. Again, if we believe that about fathers, then we set up policies and custody laws that mean we don't need those fathers at home as much because their parenting is less important than the mother's parenting. 
Yeah, one thing that's always surprised me is if you look at statistics of, um, you know, single households where mom's in charge and there, there's really not significant uh, father contact, uh, what you see in the statistics is uh, those households have much higher rates um, of all the bad things, right? So, you know, runaways, teen pregnancies, grades in school, um, you know, issues with drugs and alcohol, all, all those rates are higher um, in, in those households. And so um, it, it's often perplexed me why the, why the system doesn't try to, you know, protect against that, particularly when there would be a father that's willing to be in the, you know, in the life of the child, um, and they, they wouldn't be encouraging that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, did your research get into that at all as far as uh, the differences between, you know, households when, when there's no dad involved versus uh, when there is one? Right. Well, we've got abundant research backing up what you've just said, that we know that when the father is involved, the outcomes are better for children. But another myth is that if, after the parents separate, if the children are being raised by their father alone, that they're going to have worse outcomes than their, if they're raised by their mother alone. And that turns out not to be true. In fact, the children being raised by a single father have better outcomes, even when we account for the differences in income between the two types of housing. So this sort of shows, again, what you're bringing up, that the father's contributions are equal to the mother's. And in many cases, the father's contributions might be superior to the mother, depending on what a particular child needs. And would you say, um, you know, father's contribution can be, um, you know, equal, but, or, you know, but different, uh, you know, because I think what moms bring to the table and what dads bring to the table, as far as, you know, what the kids learn from, from each of the genders, I, I think is incredibly different. Exactly. That's what I'm saying that we have different parenting styles. We have different personalities. We bring different things to our children. We don't need to be ranking those as whose is more important than the other. We, we need to see that both styles of parenting, both parents' personalities contribute in different ways to the children. So why would you ever want to deprive your child of one of their parents and turn that parent into an uncle through, uh, these are after the uh, parents separate. So the idea of keeping both parents actively involved, whether the parents are married or not, living together or apart, children, the research has always shown us that children have better outcomes when they are father enriched instead of father deprived. Absolutely. And I assume all this is in your book, which I want to talk about here a little bit. Uh, Myths and Lies About Dads, How They Hurt Us All is a new book that you uh, came out with. I'm going to bring it up here so folks at home can see it on the screen. Uh, but yeah, tell us a little bit about your book. How did it come about? And, um, you know, what uh, what can we learn from it? Well, we've known for years that if you stereotype groups of people, okay, if you stereotype women, let's just take that as an example. If you stereotype women, if you have all these negative myths and lies about women, you can't change the views, the policies, the, the opportunities for women until you start to get at the root of the problem. So let me give you a very specific example. A few years ago, there was a Barbie doll. And one of the things that this Barbie doll, it was a talking Barbie doll. And one of the things that that Barbie doll said was, I hate math class. Well, the feminists went berserk, okay? Here you're creating or playing into a stereotype that girls and women can't do math and science. They don't like it. They can't do it. Okay. Two years ago, 2021, McDonald's Happy Meals had a phrase that said, girls try, boys aim high. Well, the feminists didn't like that one either, because again, you're, you're feeding into a stereotype 
that is going to have implications for these are little kids you're sending this message to. So in the same way, we the book came about because until we can start to change those myths and lies about fathers, you're not going to see the kind of changes that you can see, for example, in Sweden, which is a father friendly country. So we've got to get at the roots of the problem, which is the myths and the lies and the stereotypes that we have about men as parents. Then we can start to change the policies. So that's how I got into writing the book is let's address, let me address the myths that are most damaging to fathers' relationships with their children and that are most damaging to women because they hold women back from having the freedom that they would like to have in balancing work and family roles. Well, fantastic. And uh, where can uh, where can we find your book or where can we get a copy of it? Uh, hit the Amazon books page. Uh, our books are there. Uh, I also have a personal website, a university website. If people want to go there, there's more information about my, my books. Um, Amazon's the place to go. And, you know, would this be a good book, say, to, you know, buy a couple copies and maybe send to your legislators? Because I know there's uh, particularly a few legislators that I can think of that have often, um, you know, perpetuated some of these myths back to me when I'm advocating for things. I mean, it would be good, kind of a good idea to maybe send them a copy. It's written very briefly. It's a thin book. It's meant to be read. You know, you don't have to put 20 hours into reading this. Part of the reason for that is I want it to be a book that legislative people, that people who are working in the court systems, that busy judges and lawyers, that they can read this. It's accessible. They can read it very quickly. And the language is user friendly. It's not a research college textbook. It's a book for um, People who want to get the information, get it quickly, get it simply, get it easily. Well, fantastic. Well, Dr. Lynn Nielsen, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate your time today and, and coming on talking to us about this really important topic. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's a great brief way for people to just uh, get familiar with uh, some of the, the things out there that, you know, just aren't really true. And, and uh, it's, it's going to be a way for us to help change this in our society. I hope so. I truly do. And thank you. And for all the work that the National Parenting Association is doing to also try to undermine those myths and lies and stereotypes about men as parents. Well, you're very welcome. And we'll put a link uh, up to the uh, your website here, uh, your university website, and uh, also to uh, where people can pick this up on Amazon. So thanks so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks so much.